Okay, uh, welcome back. Uh, in the last class, we have looked at uh, the various events in the history where uh, the most of the failures are associated with the uh, fatigue in general. And we have seen how the fatigue caused failures in the case of rail axle joints or trains or in, in the aeroplanes and so on. So, in, the, from, in today's class, we will look at, uh, also we have uh, looked at uh, how fatigue failure uh, in general can be uh, assessed in a material. In today's class, we will look at how uh, different types of uh, loads, fatigue loads uh, can be uh, classified into different kinds and different kinds of fatigue analysis procedures. And that is something that we are going to look at in today's class. Okay. So, uh, here the fatigue failure, uh, most of the data, fatigue failure data uh, for the first time was published by August Wuller from Germany. So, he did his uh, experiments on rail wheel axles for about several years, so 12 to 15 years of his uh, work is only to do experiments on these rail wheel axles under repeated loading. And then he collated all the data of his work conducted over a period of 20 years research. And then he found out that the, uh, the number of cycles of time varying stress is the culprit for the failure, premature failure of these rail wheel axles. Okay? And he also identified that there is something called a, an endurance limit for materials like steels. That is, uh, this limit is the stress level below which you will never have failure. That means, the material is going to give you infinite life. That means, the, if you are loading the material over number of cycles, it will not fail if the stress level the load uh, applied load is below this particular level called endurance limit. Okay? And so, uh, in general, because in, instead of calling it as an infinite life, the uh, general uh, uh, convention is that if the stress level below which the material is guaranteed to give a million of fully reversed cycles. We will see what do we mean by fully reversed in a moment. So, fully reversed cycle, then such stress limit is called endurance limit. Okay? So, here, here we are actually showing the schematic of uh, SN diagram, stress life diagram. S stand for stress, N for number of cycles. That is why it is called stress life diagram. which is the outcome of uh, Euler's research, wherein he actually plotted on the y axis uh, the stress amplitude. On the y axis, he has plotted stress amplitude versus the number of cycles. And he has plotted this on a log scale. On the normal scale, it is not a straight line, but on a log log plot, it is actually a straight line. So, as you can see here. So, here you can see the 10 power 0 cycles meaning actually one cycle, right? So, that means it is not really a time varying stress. Then you would expect the, whenever we are talking about fatigue failure, we are actually talking about fracture, right? So, since we are talking about fracture, so the material under static load is known to fracture at ultimate tensile strength. So, that is the maximum load that it can take, right? So, ultimate strength of the material is here at 10 power 0 cycles. And as you increase the number of cycles. So, that means at 10 power 0 cycles, the material fails at a stress amplitude of equal, stress amplitude equal into equal to ultimate strength. Okay? So, here we will say what do we mean by stress amplitude in a minute. And suppose if you reduce the stress amplitude, that means the applied stress amplitude on the material, let us say somewhere here, then you see that the material will fail in say, uh, say 90 cycles. It is a log scale, so it is not linear. Please keep that in mind. So, it fails in 90 cycles when you have your stress amplitude little less than SUT. That means, up to 90 cycles, it will uh, be fine. After 90 cycles, it will actually fail. And like that, if you, uh, so here you see that something called SE dash. And if you look at it, the number of cycles to failure is 1 million, 10 power 6 cycles, that is 1 million cycles. And this SE dash is what we call endurance limit of the material or endurance strength of the material. 
and below which so you we are only now focusing on black line that is actually typically for uh, steel uh, materials a steel kind of materials which actually show endurance limit that means beyond if your applied stress amplitude is less than SE dash then the material will not fail that means this is actually if you you can think of this black line as a failure surface failure line failure boundary okay if you think this is a failure boundary if you take any stress state somewhere below uh, SE dash that is your uh, uh, endurance limit you see that it never touches your failure surface that means it is never going to fail so it's it has infinite life in that sense so that is why SC dash your endurance limit is the uh, one of the important properties of the material below which the material is going to give infinite life okay however note that not all materials show this uh, very uh, behavior of endurance limit there are certain materials which do not show any, any endurance limit that means there is no infinite life that you can expect from these materials and such materials are called materials which do no endurance limit materials typically aluminum alloys do not show this endurance limit that means you have your fatigue strength is actually changing as a function of even below so there is nothing called endurance limit and hence this curve will not flatten out at sc dash but it continues to go down right so it means if you are reducing your amplitude you are going to get a larger life but not infinite life as in the case of uh, the uh, steel materials okay now we have discussed this is this something called stress amplitude so let us look at what do we mean by so when we are saying that fatigue is nothing but uh, fatigue loading is nothing but a, a time varying load that means if you take a material point uh, at a point in, uh, any point in a material at that point the stress state is going to change as a function of time and in the module when we have looked at static failure theories there what we said was the stress state at a point is time invariant that means it does not change with respect to time but now we are saying that it is going to change with respect to time the stress state at that particular point correct when we say the stress state at a particular point is actually going to change as a function of time now we need to also say how is it going to change as a function of time what is the nature in which it is going to change as a function of time depending upon the nature in which it is the stress state is going to change as a function of time the stress state can be classified into primarily into three classes so that means the the nature of this change can actually be classified into three primary classes the first one is called fully reversed loading and then you have something called repeated loading and then you have something called fluctuating loading so what do we mean by fully reversed loading so here for the sake of uh, convenience i have shown these uh, on, here in this plots on the y axis you have stress on the x axis you have time so these numbers are only representative don't pay much attention to these numbers these numbers can be different so this basically the value of the stress that can be very different i have chosen to plot between certain numbers but the idea is to see the nature of the variation of the stress <laughs> okay so when you say fully reversed loading so now let us look at this stress here here in this uh, particular uh, loading scenario the maximum stress is one that is that is your sigma max and the minimum stress is minus one that is sigma min so here what you can actually see is that sigma max is equal to negative of sigma min that means their magnitudes are the same that means the maximum stress and the minimum stress they are same by their magnitude but the signs are different that means if sigma max is a tensile the maximum stress is tensile the minimum stress is compressive but the magnitudes of this maximum tensile part and minimum uh, maximum compressive part are the same so sigma max is equal to sigma min okay and such a loading scenario is called fully reversed loading that means why we why are we calling it as fully reversed in one situation you are experiencing maximum tensile stress and in the next situation at the, the same material point so after some time say for instance you are starting here at time t equal to 0 at time at at time t 1 okay so let's say this is about 2.5 seconds okay 
you have a, the material point is experiencing a maximum tensile stress of 1 here and by the time you reach time 5 seconds then what is happening the same material point is experiencing a compressive stress of 5 MPa 5 sorry compressive stress of 1 MPa let us say this is in units is MPa. So, it is experiencing magnitude wise the same value but in one at one particular time the maximum value is actually a tensile state at another uh, point of time the maximum value is same value but it is compressive state of stress. That means the nature of the stress is completely reversed in one side it is tension another side it is compression that is why it is called fully reversed loading ok. So, so the way to characterize a fully reversed loading is to see what is my sigma max and sigma mu. And please pay attention to this dashed blue line that is what we call mean stress. Typically we designate that with sigma m and you can clearly see that when you are dealing with fully reversed loading the mean stress will become 0 that is one of the uh, key uh, parameters that we are going to use during the uh, analysis of fatigue failure. So, when your mean stress is 0 then you can actually say that it is fully reversed loading ok. All right. Now, get let us come to repeated loading. So, here when you are talking about repeated loading again you see this uh, uh, this is your maximum stress and that is your minimum stress. Here the entire stress state is in the tensile regime right there is no at a no time the material point is experiencing compressive stress all the time it is only exp experiencing a tensile state of stress correct. However, in general when we are defining repeated loading it can be either completely in tensile regime or a completely in compressive regime, but we are not going to look at compressive regime because we know that the uh, fatigue failure is basically due to extension of crack that is what we have discussed in when we are dealing uh, with the fracture mechanics module. So, we know that a crack propagates when the local state of stress is sort of tension under compressive state of stress the cracks do not open up, but they rather close and hence here we are not showing compressive stress, but the definition of repeated loading need not be only confined to tensile regime ok. Here again when we are talking about repeated loading the minimum stress is 0 and maximum stress is some positive value here and as a result your sigma mean is going to be greater than 0 when you are working in the tensile regime ok. So, sigma min equal to 0 is your repeated loading. So, that means you are from 0 you are actually repeating your load. So, you are going to you are 0 and going to some maximum value and again coming to 0 and go again going to maximum value. And please note that this is actually what we are plotting is stress state evolution of stress state at a point as a function of time ok. So, if you look at different points in the material each of these points may be undergoing different uh, cycling or different nature of variation of the stresses, but here we are only focusing on at one point. But when you are talking about design we you typically look at the most critical point you know what is going to be most critical point expected to be most critical point and then you try, try to assess the nature of variation of stresses as a function of time at that particular point all right. So, this is about repeated loading and now come here we are talking about fluctuating loading wherein the minimum stress is not actually equal to 0 that means you have some sigma max and this is your sigma min and this is your sigma mean mean stress and this is minimum stress. And here we have shown this is completely in uh, what you call uh, tensile regime, but there is nothing actually stops it to have the minimum stress in the negative regime. So, you can actually have something like this, this is also a feasible uh, definition for fluctuating loading. The fluctuating loading basically means that your minimum stress is not 0 and it is not equal to maximum stress that is all it means ok. So, you can have any sort of fluctuation you can have some 
the maximum stress can be positive, minimum stress can be negative. That means your crack or your material point is experiencing uh, so for some time a tensile state of stress or some time uh, compressive state of stress. But the compressive state of stress that it is experiencing is not necessarily equal to the tensile state of stress. If it is equal, then it, you, call, you would have called it as fully re reversal loading. But since it is not equal, then you are calling it as fluctuating loading. Okay? So, these are the three different kinds of uh, loading scenarios that one would uh, come across when we are dealing with the fatigue failure of fatigue loading of uh, dynamic loading of materials. And in the first module, we will be primarily focusing on fully reversed loading, where mean stress is equal to 0. And once we have understood how to analyze problems where mean stress is equal to 0, then we will move on to uh, the uh, looking at situations when you have finite mean stress. What do we need to do when you have finite mean stress? What is the effect of having a non-zero mean stress on the material is something that we will look at once we understood the situation of uh, designing components based on uh, uh, subjected to fully reversed loading. All right. So, now if I would plot all these three loading scenarios on the same graph, this is how it looks like. So, the blue one is fully reversed loading and the black one is uh, repeated loading and the red one is fluctuating loading and you can clearly see that here you have zero mean, zero mean stress and here you have some uh, the repeated loading has some po positive mean stress and also fluctuating loading in this particular scenario has some positive mean stress. Okay? All right. So, now uh, we have actually discussed this uh, when we are talking about various failures that were observed in the history. Most of them are associated with the fatigue failure. And we have also uh, seen that there are huge costs involved with fatigue failure. Uh, and also, if you even when there is failure and even if you want to avoid the fatigue failure, that means you need to put in a lot of energy and understanding to uh, develop devise new methodologies to avoid fatigue failure. So, that is actually a, an area which involves a lot of uh, efforts from scientific community which costs a lot of money. Right? And we have already seen that the fatigue failure always starts at a crack. So, you have a crack to begin with and then that actually acts as a driving point, a dri driving scenario for eventual failure of the material under fatigue. And we have seen that a situation of a uh, comet airplane uh, case study, where we have seen that the small uh, small crack that is generated at the corner of a square shaped window airplane, window of the airplane, which acts as a uh, uh, stress intensity, stress concentration region and that led to a small crack and that eventually uh, led to the complete uh, breakage of the component. So, the key is that you have you should not have stress concentration regimes in your design. Whenever you are having a material which is going to be subjected to dynamic loading, you should always ensure that you minimize the regions where you may have stress concentration. Because it may be not it may not be possible to remove these regions which have stress concentration altogether, but you can al always try to reduce the effect of that stress concentration.